People power growth, but recruiting and onboarding are expensive, exhausting, and absolutely overwhelming. I've been there and it doesn't have to be this way. Welcome to Hire and Empower. I'm your host, Molly McGrath. Join me as we interview leaders who care about their teams and distill powerful lessons from them. This show is sponsored by H&E, helping organizations to find their best hire and empower them for success. Learn more at hiringandempowering.com. Okay, so yeah, what are you seeing in 2023, Jim? And then I'll go to you, Tyson, in regards to best practice approaches here in the post-pandemic world, if you will. We're seeing a lot of opportunity. We are a growth mindset pair. We spend a lot of time you know, thinking about the future. And I think that the future is bright for law firm owners. I think more and more people are venturing out on their own and trying to grow something that is bigger than themselves. I think that lawyers are starting to see that the grind and the way that they sort of soldiered through the pandemic is probably not how they want to live long term. And they've come to the realization that they need help, they need community, and they need to talk to other people who are like-minded and growth-oriented. And I think that the sky's the limit. What do, what do you see is, like, I love that you said the grind, the hustle, what have you. Now it's time for the power of the pause. People are saying, oof, I'm burned out. I'm exhausted. I can't keep going at this pace. Massive, massive growth in the legal space. And what are you seeing you know, as the leveling out, so to speak, that you're speaking about on your extraordinary podcast, your Facebook groups. Um, What what are you seeing as, dare I say, the new normal? Can we do that, Jim? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Usually we alternate, so that I'm just- Yeah. (laughs) We can kind of, we can go back to that. I mean, I think that the the easy answer is that, you know, the pandemic changed the mindset of a lot of people and they they realized that whenever there was that pause and there wasn't a lot going on, they enjoyed that and they didn't like working for other people. So I think that that's going to continue. But I mean, there were so many advances that had to happen for, for people to actually work and with being virtual. I mean, we're like, I know that my office is a, it's a hybrid office. We've got two physical offices, but we've got the majority of our people are virtual and people enjoy that. We give people that option and most people choose the option to work from home. And so the workforce for the most part wants to work from home and you're going to have to see employers going to have to actually abide by that. Otherwise they're not going to be able to attract top talent. And that's one of the, the things that Jim and I both are able to do is we're able to attract top talent with, by, by giving that as an option. So you're going to see a lot more of that. And I think that's one of the, the major drivers in that. But I mean, back to your original question though, I, I think that it's easy for a lot of people to say, okay, so what are we seeing in 2023? And we can talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning with chat GPT. We can talk about that. Yeah, that's a massive thing. And there's a massive opportunity there. But the, the, the thing that wins, and it, this is boring, Jim and I were just talking about it. The thing that wins uh, is consistency overall. Um, it, it doesn't matter if you get your clients by sending a physical newsletter in the mail, as long as you're consistent with it, so consistency is what's effective. It, people like to latch on to, oh my gosh, what's, what's going to happen 2023, 2024, 2025. If you go back to 2022, the thing that won was consistency. That's what it was. It's always, it's consistency is undefeated. I love that you talked about top talent and people during the pandemic went ahead and hung their own shingle, what have you, took stock. We all got forced to sit on our couch for a minute and really take stock of our life, our work, our practice, what we do, where we work and serve our clients the majority of our waking hours. And I, for 26 years, have served in the legal space and staffing. And unemployment rate, we all know it. I mean, especially with the associate attorneys and paralegals, under 2%. And what do you, and I love that you use consistency. I love that you're able to retain and maintain employees. I just want to hop on that one. Like, what do you, you're offering virtual, you know, you're having some fluidity and flexibility in your culture and your physical brick and mortar building, what have you. What, what else are y'all doing to, to keep people? Because we need people. We need people to grow. We need people to be free. 
freed up to be the visionary as an entrepreneur uh, and grow the law firm and impact as many families as we can. What do you, what are you, what are you doing? Like I'm struggling. I get my, my phone rings off the hook. Oh, I just had another associate leave. I just had another paralegal leave and, and the struggle's real, right? I want to get to that in just a second. First, I want to talk about that time you mentioned on the couch. And my therapist is a Buddhist and she's very Zen and very chill. And she, when the pandemic first started during those first six weeks, when we were all really at home, you know, we were, I mean, I was walking every day. I was taking care of myself. Life had slowed down and it was bad. Obviously people were sick and dying and there's that whole piece of it. But for the people that weren't affected in such a hard way, it was a great reset. And, and I'm reading right now, Think and Grow Rich. And there's a, a passage in there about how the depression in the 20s was a great re reset. So I think we really did have sort of a once in a generation opportunity for reset. And like with all things, it's good and bad. It's, it's insightful and it's hard. It it presents opportunities and it presents difficulties. So I think as law firm owners, we really need to be cognizant of that. We really need to see that, like you said, more people are willing to strike out on their own. More people are looking around and saying, why the heck am I staying here? What What's in it for me? What, what Where do I want to go? Why am I doing this? A lot of self-questioning and 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 that's that's where my buddhist therapist would be so happy that we're that we're actually having these conversations that we we didn't have before because our routine got broken right our routine got broken so that is and that is like i said a good and a hard thing both things can be true now what we've done when it comes to staffing is um we've actually looked overseas so right now our firm is sitting at around 53 people in St. Louis, which is where our headquarters are, we have about 18. So we have two attorneys in Ohio, an attorney in California, attorney in Virginia. We do immigration, so it's federal, so it doesn't really matter where people are, and it gives us flexibility. We have an attorney in Oregon, and then we have a remote team in Argentina, which consists of our a lot of our call center team. Um, we have paralegals down there who are actually lawyers in Argentina, so we've really had to be creative and think outside the box to try to find the talent and and the people that we need to grow the firm. And if I can add on to that, I, please, because it's something that I, we've been using overseas talent for for quite a while for the last twelve years, really. Um, but I, I think that there is a huge opportunity that you look remotely not just overseas, but in the US. So we we tested this out over the last, now it's been about, uh, I think 11 months where we were testing out um, same job ads, same everything, same pay, uh, but we, we made it more of a remote position across the country. And we've been able to attract talent for the same cost as what we're paying people in St. Louis, uh, sometimes cheaper, uh, but they're they're like top talent in different states and because if you if you really look like for example let's say you're a new york law firm right we're not a new york law firm but if you're a new york law firm you're used to paying high high wages right but the reality is if you look across the country there's a lot of sweet spots for example alabama is one of those sweet spots where you could pick off top talent for a, a fraction of what you're paying a new york person right it's just that's the reality of what it is so i think looking at at home around the country, there's a lot of opportunities, but you also have to be, Jim is intentional with his hiring. We're, we are intentional with our hiring and you have to be intentional about it because what people do is they go, oh, I need a new person. Let's put up a job at, and they give it no thought about who they're bringing in. They give no thought, they have no hiring process. You've got to have a hiring process. And so you've got to be deliberate with it and, and don't just put a person in a chair. You've got to think like, do they fit with the culture? Culture is really, really important. And if you hire someone that that is really bad for your culture, it can be really toxic. And, yeah. and you've got to be, and there, there is a chance for a reset at any time. We, we um, I don't know if you've read top grading, but we implemented top grading uh, right around 10 months ago. And there, you sort of have to kind of process people out. And then, so you can process people in and that's the nice way of putting it, but that's you, when you start to implement things like that and you get deliberate with things, you, the dynamic of your firm is going to change, but it's, you're doing it deliberately. Wow. 
I, so I love that you put that um, comparison with putting remote in ads. Jim goes overseas, you're staying in the US, maybe a combo of two. This is what I'm hearing over and over again. So I tell lawyers when they call me, they're maybe have old school rigid mindset that, nope, I want them in the office. I need them in the office. And what's followed after that statement? Because I don't know what they're doing when, if they're not sitting in my office, right? So I'd love to get your perspective. So you made a massive leap, you 12 years in and going overseas, staying in the U.S. doesn't matter regardless of it. How, like, how do you know what people are doing every day in that place and getting the KPIs is all the buzzword in this day and age as well? Well, KPIs, as you know, Molly, are, are obviously very different than what are they doing? I don't give, can I cuss on here? Yo, hell yeah. <laughs> I, don't give, I, don't, I don't give a fuck what they're doing. I don't give a, I mean, I see these people talking in the big group about, you know, where do I get software so that I can see whether my VAs overseas are, are you know, <laughs> billing me for playing on Facebook? Listen, listen, this is a results economy. And for law firms, it's about the results. It's what I, I don't want to be in the business of micromanaging them. I don't want to be in the business of having to spy on them with some nanny cam to make sure that they're <laughs> not, not screwing around. I don't care if they're screwing around. If they're getting my work done and they're hitting my KPIs, all is well. But this, this 1950s mentality of the factory where I'm the overseer at the top of the factory and I'm watching everybody on the assembly line, making sure that nobody's taking a smoke break or, or you know, checking out, <laughs> checking on their kids. I mean, I don't care. I literally don't care. And in fact, I want them to be well-rounded people. I want them to be balanced people. I want them to come to work and be ready to work. And if they're working at two in the morning because their kids are asleep, or if they're, if they're, you know, doing stuff on the weekend to catch up, as long as the work that I expect them to do and that we've agreed upon they're responsible for, that's just babysitting. That's just bad management. If they think that they need to be able to micromanage on that level, that's because they suck as business owners and law firm owners. Oh my God. Mic drop right there. <laughs> I love it. That is phenomenal. I love it. This is a results driven economy. I, yeah, the, the very, very different. What are they doing in KPIs? I love that distinction, Jim. Tyson, what you got? I, I think that, I mean, Jim just hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, I laugh when people say, oh, but I, I got to know what they're doing. They, I got to I got to have them in that chair. I got to have them. What are you talking about? No, no, you don't. What? So you can go into their office and bother them so you can you know, get your coffee and have a little nice chit chat with them. No, you're bothering them. They don't want to be in your office because you're interrupting their work. And Jim's absolutely right. If you're hitting all your key numbers, I care about what our average fee is. And I care about the number of cases we settle. That's pretty much all I care about. Right. And if you're doing those things, then great. But here's here's the other thing: the, the the same people that say that they need to the the micromanage and see everything and put the softwares on their computers and all that are the same ones that will leave the office early. That they're not the ones putting in the work themselves. And that it's, this this is the hey asshole moment where they they see you doing those things and they don't want to do the work either. If you're not going to do the work, they're not going to do the work. And so. It, it, it's amazing to me. It's it's always the same people too. It's the same lawyers that want to micromanage that don't want to put in the work. They just want to try to, yeah, Jim, go go with that because you, you please when Jim puts up we his finger, he's I, mean, he's, I, I, he's I know. <laughs> we we had a hot seat a uh, couple quarters ago, and one of our favorite members was there, and he was complaining about how he can't find associates where he lives, and. People, and so he so he presents this issue, this problem that he's having. He talks for five or 10 minutes, and then everyone gets to chime in for like 20 minutes. And people would say, well, have you thought about remote workers? Oh, that doesn't work in our model. Um, have you thought about uh, part-time attorneys or out-of-state attorneys? Oh, that doesn't work for our model. So everything was, that doesn't work in our model. Well, listen, brother, maybe your model's not working. That's what I said, <laughs> right? So maybe, maybe we need a new model. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Is this really where, like, talk to me. I know you're having amazing conversations in your conferences, on your podcasts, in your Facebook group, and the guild. 
is this like where we're at right now for those firms, for that brother that's sitting in the hot seat and said, that won't work for my model, for my firm, what have you. What do you see if they do not truly take a look at the model, take a look at the way they're doing what they're doing and their mindset around this? What do you have to say? Is this a wave of um, where we're headed with law firms in 2023? If you do not pivot, and I know that word is so abused, but if you, what are you guys seeing for the law firms that are going to be like stick their heels into that mindset? Well, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a pivot problem. I don't think people need to think about pivoting. I think that they just need to stop and think because, and I think it's, this is normal. I think it's completely normal for people to like, I, I used to do criminal defense, right? And so it was very normal for me to have to get up in the morning, drive, you know, an hour to a court and then just drive around all freaking morning to different courthouses. And then in the afternoon, I'm meeting with clients and I'm going to, the, to, to, to do jail visits. And next thing you know, you're on to the next day and the next day and the next day. And it's easy to get stuck in that grind and you're sort of in this rut and you're doing every day. And so the, the, the law firm owners, it, it's a normal feeling to have that, but the value comes whenever you kind of step back a little bit. You don't have to pivot in what you're doing, but you do have to step back and think about where do I want this firm to go? Where is my time best spent? So I guess if there is a trend, because there is what right behind 2023, there is there's private pri private equity coming in to the legal space. Okay, it's yeah. coming. It's already in a few states. Yeah. It's going to get more efficient, okay? And you're going to have a lot more competition over the next decade than what we had over the last decade. So you need to make your firms more efficient and get ready for it because it's coming and people need to stop. And I think just having a pause, if the message is anything, it's take a pause and think about where you're headed with your firm and be deliberate. Like another word you can use is be deliberate, right? Be deliberate about what you're doing. Efficiency. Everybody, what, what are we talking about when be more efficient? What, what does that mean for the two of you? Well, as Stephen Covey would say, we begin with the end in mind, right? So what do we want? And what, you know, is there a difference between what we say what we want and what we're actually working towards, right? So I think if, if you want to talk about efficiency, you have to ask yourself, okay, well, what is the final outcome? What What's the ideal experience for our team? How do we want to create our work product? And then look at all the ways that we can simplify it, that we can delegate it, that we can have the person with the least amount of talent doing the low-level stuff and the people with the higher talent doing the most important stuff. So many lawyers that we talk to spend their time doing $5 work when they should be doing $50,000 work, right? And so I think that Tyson's point that he just made about stopping and thinking is critical for law firm owners in 2023 and beyond because we're just so reactive and so bouncy around and so undisciplined that all that all that anger and vitriol we're trying to impose on our staff, we should be focusing on ourselves and ask ourselves my favorite question from Jerry Colonna, which is how have we how have we been complicit in creating the conditions that we say that we don't want? And I think that's just a really Ooh. insightful question because it just forces you to take responsibility. Everything at our firm is our fault. Anything that's going wrong at our firm, it's our fault. We are the only ones who have the power to change it. And so we can bitch all we want, but if we're not doing the legwork, and like Tyson said, if our team doesn't know that we're in the trenches with them, they're going to be like, who's that asshole who comes in every three days and yells at me? You know, I don't, I don't have any loyalty to that person. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I mean, I, th I think I think a simple exercise. I haven't talked about this in a while, but a simple exercise that people can do that are sort of struggling is you just take. It's really simple, right? You map out the case from start to finish. So if you do an injury case, from the moment that really the person gets in the crash, map out that experience for that client from start to the end of the case and make it ideal, right? And you you pick out all the benchmarks in there. And in an injury case, it's speed. And in most, most practice areas, it's speed. And you're talking about efficiency. Okay, let's get this thing fast. So 
you know, like that, whatever that time frame is, let's try to shrink it down as much as possible. And it, it can be hard with injury cases because you, it's not like you want to rush a case, but you can do things to make it more efficient. For example, medical records is a massive time suck for a lot of injury firms. And so what let's, let's pick apart that part of the process and how do we shrink that down and make it as fast as possible. So if you just go through the simple process of mapping out your case, like a timeline, start to finish and start to pick apart points where it's slow and you can, you can improve. And then you, you can't, you can't like make everything perfect, but over time you can make it better. And just doing that little exercise will help you tremendously. As you said that, I'm like, wow, imagine doing that with your team and treating it like a mini workshop and and having fun with it and sitting down talking about being in the trenches with your team, talking about being deliberate, talking about speed, talking about consistency, efficiency. And I love that efficiency, speed. I love that, especially with what is coming. I think a lot of attorneys don't believe it. We've seen it in the dental space. We've, I mean, so I love that you said that of sitting down the pause, take a step back, take a case from cradle to grave. And as you're saying that and bringing in your team, how about bringing your team to do that as well? And for them to, I hear from attorneys all the time, you know, business would be great, but for the employees, nobody will step up and lead. I'm like, have you given them permission? Have you given them permission? Have you enrolled them? Have you taken the pause and sat and taken a, a case from the beginning to the end for them to see, hey, attorney, why are you doing that? Didn't you hire me to do that? Can I step up and lead? And a lot of times I think, you know, it's this kind of blessing and a curse, if you will. I hired these people and nobody you know, will follow the process, step up in all the complaints that they're bitching about, what have you. But your employees are a relationship. Have you given them any time, attention, and feedback to even pour in them? Have you given them permission to lead? And, or are you just white knuckling everything to Jim's point? You know, the brain surgeon model that I'm the guru, I'm the guy is not scalable and sellable. Yeah. On that, okay, so, Jim, real quick, sorry. Uh, we, we're, we're both getting worked up over this one. So <laughs> if, if that's your model, right? Um, it, I, I always I always think back to this, um, and I don't know if this is true. I've heard about this story about Donald Rumsfeld, right? And Donald Rumsfeld, whenever he was, uh, whenever George Bush was in the uh, in the White House, what happened is every morning um, they were, they called them snowflakes, right? And uh, he had a he had sticky notes, and this is the story. I'm, so I'm just repeating the story that I heard. So he, he had these sticky notes, and and people would be in, in a line every single morning, and he would hand out sticky notes, and you'd see them leave the White House. And they would call them snowflakes as they were leaving the White House. That is not a very efficient leadership model. Okay. That is, if everything's at the top, if that's your leadership model, you've not given all of your team members that, that permission, that authority to make decisions. And if you're struggling, read the book, Turn Your Ship Around, right? Turn the Ship Around. I think this is the name of it. It is a great book where you need to empower your people because that is extremely inefficient if everything's come up to the top. And a lot, that's how a lot of law firm owners are because they are the lawyer of the law firm. They're running the law firm. Everything sort of runs through them and it's extremely inefficient. And so you, you've you got to empower your people to make those small decisions from the small decisions to the big decisions. They've got to be empowered to make mistakes. They've got to, otherwise you're going to be stuck in that rut for the next 30 years of your career. If you're still in business. That's the cost. Of, <laughs> that's the cost of delegation. The cost of delegation is whether or not you're comfortable letting them make mistakes and not going nuts, not losing your shit. If, if you, I mean, obviously you want to have safeguards, so there's no malpractice, but short of that, you've got to be comfortable in letting go because so many of the people that we see struggle with delegations are the control yes. freaks who won't let things go. And, and, won't let people make mistakes. Obviously, we all know it. Mistakes are the best way to learn. And as long as you're not harming your client, and as long as you're not, you know, downgrading the reputation of the firm, within those boundaries, you got to give your team a lot of leeway. And you can always have safety nets or safeguards, like, like a safeguard would be before something goes out, it's reviewed by you or another attorney. But that doesn't mean you have to be the one to put the paper in the printer. That doesn't mean that, you know, if you can get your team to get it 85, 90% of the way done, the way you want it. Um, now, for, Tyson would say you got to get the way you want it all into a system so they can do it almost 99%. But 
but if you if you want that catch all for the first six months, do it and then eventually just let it go. Jim, how do you get comfortable with letting go? I hear this from attorneys like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That one time I did let go and I got a bar complaint. That's that one time, yeah. they're always picking from their past, their past experience of that one time that I did let go, not doing that again. You just have to ask yourself, do I really want to delegate or do I want a one person show? I mean, that's the, that's the cost of business, the cost of having something bigger than yourself, the cost of having a firm with 53 people is you got to let go of a whole lot of stuff. And you, that should start off by letting go of the things you hate to do and that you're not good at, then let go of the things that you don't like to do that you are good at, and then let go of the things that you're good at and you like to do. And that's that's really the right mindset. And if you don't, it's fine. But don't say that you want something else and then not do it. That's the cost of admission. Yes. Tyson, what you got? No, I, I agree with that. The um, that what Jim just said is really important because people tell us all the time that they want one thing and they really don't. They they're saying that they want that one thing because it's cool, right? It's they they want this whatever it is, right? They they want to run a a one hundred person law firm and they really don't. They say it because it sounds cool and they see other people saying that they want it. And if they really were to step back and think about what their vision is for their career, then they 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 would realize okay. That's not what I what I really want. But to address your your question though, right? Okay, you can you can still say, yeah, I I did that that one time, and then this happened. I got a bar complaint. Let's say that that's what it is. Okay, or I had a bad I had a bad hire, and then they don't want to ever hire someone again. Yes, right. that, that's the like that's like the number one, right? Okay, well, what did you learn from that, right? Why did you have the bad hire? What what could you have done differently to catch some of those things? You can't catch catch everything. Okay, it may have been that one thing that slipped through. It's usually not though. It's usually you didn't have a hiring process in place. And, and so you just hired whomever and then you put them in a seat and they, they were terrible. And you didn't know that because you didn't ask the right questions, but just step back and assess, okay, well, why did these things happen? Okay. Now what's, what, what fail safes can we put in place? What bumpers can we put in place to prevent it from happening again? That will allow you to, to sort of step back. For example, we have one, one of our checklist items that we have for case managers case comes through. If the statute of limitations after the case is signed is less than 90 days out, that's a big red flag for us. So it pops up a red flag and we say, we need to alert an attorney right away and address the issue. So you can put in fail safes like that so that you're alerted. Is it 100%? Could someone just check that box off and say, oh, no big deal. And, and someone blows a statute. I guess that's 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 fine, but that's probably a hiring problem. You're, that's probably a management problem. That's probably something else. So, so just step back and ask yourself why they happened put in things in place to, to help correct it. So it doesn't happen again. And you're fine. But you just have to step back and you have to, you have to sort of trust the process a little bit. Mm, and getting clear. I love that. And what you really want your, I, all the time I'll get calls from attorneys that are contacting us for hiring and we're on a path of growth. We're going to 10 X this year, blah, blah, blah. And like, mm, no, why, why do you want that? Talk to me a little bit about it because you don't want to spend the money for it. You don't want to pay your people. Right. But they're comparing themselves to so-and-so that they saw in a Facebook group or saw at a conference or what have you. And they're like, God, this guy or gal, this practice has it all. And I love that you said get really clear with yourself if you're not willing to fail fast and you're not willing to get into action and be able to let go then maybe that's not the model for you and just really getting clear with yourself right so you all got to a point obviously you let go you built very very successful law firms talk to me about this passion project that you have with Maximum Lawyer. I know you're doing a lot of amazing stuff to support attorneys in the legal space to grow their practice using your model. And as a lab, you all have proof of concept, tried, tested, proven. Talk to us about what you're up to in regards to supporting law firms and lawyers. So I've come to the conclusion that my purpose in life is to try to ease people's suffering. And I do that as an immigration lawyer by helping people stay in the United States, come to the United States, be joined with their family, be protected. And I think that transfers right over to Maximum Lawyer. I mean, the whole thing started because Tyson and I were trying to figure things out and we're talking things through. And I thought these are good conversations. And we thought this would make 
a good podcast. So it started with that. And so, you know, the lots of growth, lots of new opportunities and, and new connections that we've made with people. But for the most part, I think most law firm owners are suffering and they're suffering in silence. And I think that's why mm -hmm. the Facebook group really grew was because it was a place where it was okay to have a growth mindset where, um, you know, we don't allow any negativity in there. Like if people are bitching out, they go right. Um, or if they're spammy or self-promotional, or if they, if they're just negative or harsh out, they go. So we wanted to create a place where people could talk about the, the hardships related to, um, owning a law firm. And I say all the time in the, in the group and in the, and in the guild that this shit is hard. Other than raising kids, growing a law firm is the hardest thing we'll ever do. Um, and so I think that that's really why you called it a passion project. And I think I think it's grown into that. Um, and I think that both of us are sort of serious. And we spend time talking to law firm owners every week about the struggles that they're having. And, and, and you know, we created the group that we needed. We created the, the community that we needed. And, we, and we've taught ourselves the lessons that we learned, like, one of the great things about the podcast, Tyson had this TikTok guy on, on Tyson shared a TikTok with us yesterday. And he has a cool little message about fear of missing out. And I said, let's see if we can get him on the podcast. So we get, we get information that helps our firm. Um, and it's always easier to see problems in other people than, than in your own. Yeah. And your podcast, my goodness, it comes in my inbox. That is one podcast I listen to every single week. I absolutely love it. Tyson, how about for you? Yeah, I love it. I, I just love kind of thinking about how the the it's all sort of progressed um, because it started just me and Jim, you know, a bunch of false starts with the podcast on. Um, I can't remember what we started on. What was what, what did we start recording on, Jim? It was the um, oh Skype. Skype. Yeah, we started recording on Skype. We we had there were so many lost <laughs> episodes that we forgot to press record, you know, and, <laughs> and and then you kind of fast forward like you got okay, start then a Facebook group, and then you got the podcast, and then the conference and the guild, and it's just it's kind of cool to think about how it's progressed. And it's it's progressed with our law firms too. It's grown with our law firm law firms, which is a pretty cool part of of it, of it as well. And I think it's cool to kind of listen to some of the old episodes, like some of the advice that we gave them versus what we what we give now. We've we've learned so much. It's it's just as valuable to to me and Jim as it is to everyone else because we get to learn as we're talking to all these amazing people. I mean, like we had some amazing talents on the podcast, and there's it's just really incredible to do. But then if you kind of go to like the guild, like I, I kind of pinch myself every day, you know, about like, oh, it's amazing being in such a, a, a wonderful group of, of human beings and attorneys and successful attorneys. And you kind of have a, a spectrum of people that are sort of just starting out and then people that are doing just truly amazing things in the legal space. And it's so cool to be able to be around those people. It's, it's just, it's, it's incredible. Talk to us about the guild. Yeah, so um, the guild is what I what I say is on the podcast, you know, if you want a more high level conversation, uh, join us in the guild maxwellguild.com. And then um, that's, that's exactly what I say on the podcast. And it's, it really is, it's a great community of, I'd say, in the in the entire legal space, probably the top 5% of all, all attorneys, like they're just really, really good people, uh, great attorneys that really are about improvement and helping each other. And the great thing is, is most people they give more than they take, which is which is a rare trait to have, right? To, to yeah. find someone that's willing to give more than they are uh, than, than they'll take. But you know, we've got quarterly masterminds with training sessions as well that are that are mixed in there. They're they're two day events throughout the country. Like for example, we just got back from Scottsdale. Then we've got Austin, and then Boulder, and then Miami to wrap up the year. So really cool things. Jim just did an, an amazing workshop on on video and, and making sure because Jim's got. I don't know how many freaking views on YouTube <laughs> followers and it's, it's, it's quite incredible. And then we've got hot seats that we do and we've got training sessions that we do and, and weekly accountability calls. And it's just what, what the most important part of those is, is community. And we, we had a, um, Jim mentioned it earlier, but we had a member that was, that was sort of struggling last week and the, the rallying around him this week has been just incredible, just incredible. And they don't even know who the person is, right? They don't even know who the person is, but they they were, the, the comments, the videos, the just the showing of like, hey, we've got your back was was quite incredible. So um, it's just, it's a, it's a great group of people. What I love about what you said, successful attorneys, successful lawyers, 
And the definition of success is just not money in the bank. It's just not bodies in the building, so to speak. And what I hear from you and Jim that I really think distinguishes your organization, the work that you all are doing, it's not about the billable hour. It's not about tracking time. It's not about more money. There are so many organizations out there that, yeah, they buy on paper, these law firms, I mean, so successful, more money than they ever could have imagined, more impact than they ever could imagine, but they're just so broken. They're angry all the time. They hate their employees. They're constantly bitching about their employees, what have you. They have all this money. They have all this success, all the building, satellite offices, all the things that on paper make your definition of success. But I would love for you all just to kind of to re- tie a bow on this. What does success mean for you when you talk about successful lawyers? Because there's something different. There is absolutely something different. And in our listeners, I'm going to put all the links, all the show notes, the Facebook group, and I'll have you guys mention that. But there is something different about what the two of you are up, you know, be, before we started recording. I just like even your 75 hard episode that the two of you did together, the vulnerability there, the transparency. I mean, it's, it's just a different vibe that the two of you, I'd love to hear what success, truly what the definition of success means for each of you. My son calls the guild AA for lawyers. I haven't told Tyson that, but that's, that's <laughs> oh, you're doing lawyer AA again. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have read the big book and I'm, I've been, I've been in the 12 step world for a long time. So we definitely bring some of that vibe to it, but I really do think it's, it's about finding that connection and, 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 and giving people permission to make mistakes, to acknowledge the struggle, to talk about the hard things. Success for me is having an impact. If it's helping an immigrant, if it's helping a lawyer, if it's helping people, like when we do our hot seats, we'll tell people, well, you can come on and talk about whatever you want. And, you know, when people get on and talk about, you know, how to become more efficient or how to run an SEO campaign, I'm like, like boo, boo hiss. I, I like it when we're digging around in the dirt, talking about the hard stuff. And that's really where the connection rises. One time we were doing a hot seat and somebody talked about their long history of problems with drinking and and it and that unlocked three other people to talk about things that they were struggling with just at that moment. And that, that to me, when that happens, that makes all this work that we're doing for the maximum lawyer community worthwhile. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I, I, cause I, I, I'm very proud of the work that we've done. Um, the work that we've done to help other lawyers. And I mean, has every podcast been absolutely amazing? No. Um, but that's, that's part of life. Right. But um, the, the, I, I think it's, it's, it's amazing to kind of look back and see the effect that we've had on the profession. And I'm, I'm very proud of that, but definition of success. I mean, for me, it's really simple. Like whenever I'm a, a grandpa, um, are, are my, are my kids, are, are they kind of talking about the, the stories that they had as a kid and are they happy about their childhoods and are they are they happy to have me as their father and and uh, to, to be the grandfather of their, of their uh, children because that is something that we lose sight of and it's very simple for me like I I want to have that right I want to have those relationships with my kids those strong bonds and I and I do that the vehicle for that's the law firm right and i demonstrate for them that the 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 hard work that it takes and the dedication to your profession and to your craft and i and i i show that by by being a successful lawyer and and showing that i really care about the thing the work that i do and 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 that you need to find something that you're that you're proud of doing and something that you're you're happy with doing and that you're um, it's okay that if you're if you don't like your profession that you can switch professions you know the, passing on those life lessons to them to me that that that's that's success to me and everyone's got their own definition of success you're so right about that there is um, Jim and I we have maximum war and minimum time it's a little course that we have that we put together for guild members and. It, we talk about you can be a stage one, two, three, four la- lawyer, whatever you want to be. If you want to be a one lawyer work a little shop and just do trademarks and that's all you want to do, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. If you want to be that big time lawyer that has you know thousands of cases and puts up a bunch of billboards, 
there's nothing wrong with that. Um, choose whatever you want to to be and go after that and be 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 okay with that. And if and you get halfway through it and you decide that's not for me, it's okay to change. It's okay to change that and and change your vision. Your vision over over the years is going to change. That's fine. You don't have to stick to it. You can always hit that reset button. Oh, I love that. And I love your definition of success, Tyson, bringing in your, your adult children and grandchildren, what have you, because at the end of the day, you're modeling it at the law firm. And I always say this um, to my clients when they come, you know, their definition of success. It's great that you're modeling a law firm, but when you bring it home and your kids get the stressed out, crappy version of you right? No, it's not an either or conversation. It's an and and wherever you go, there you are. So really bringing that doing great work in the legal space, serving families, serving your clients, serving, you know, being a phenomenal leader to your employees as well. And then your kids seeing that and bringing it home to your family as well. It's great because so many lawyers, you know, they're resentful, they're missing their kids soccer, they're missing everything. And when they are home, they're not present. The, the thundering silence, the, you know, the anxiety just pulsing through their veins. I always tell, I always say you're responsible for the energy you bring in the room and you leave in the room. And when your kids, they're, they're feeling it, they're feeling it. And they're like, mm, yeah, dad's driving a Lambo. Dad's, you know, got the big building and what have you, but boy, oh boy, I can feel it. Hmm. Wow. So, all right. Tell us, what you guys are up to tell our attorney listeners that we have here how they can stay connected with you all if they're not already uh the the easiest way they could uh stay in touch with us is listen to the podcast but also if you go to facebook we have a about six thousand member facebook group that is is phenomenal, phenomenal group yeah. Just search Maximum Lawyer and you can you can join us there. There's a few questions you'll you'll answer, but we don't allow spammers. So if you if you're a spammer, don't don't. Or bother. complainers, bitchers, no bitchers. We'll we'll <laughs> we'll punch you in a heartbeat. Um, so, <laughs> no, yeah, join us there, and then um, if you want, if you we always recommend that you start there, right? But if you are a member uh, of that group and you want to join us in the guild, maxlawguild.com is also another place to join us. Is there open enrollment time for the guild application process? It, it is. I mean, it is open enrollment um, kind of thing. Yep. We've talked about capping it. We've talked about putting it where we have certain times, but we haven't we haven't done that at this point, but it, it is open enroll, enrollment at, at, at this point. Great. Excellent. Well, I am so completely honored, completely honored. Uh, keep up the amazing work and being legal leaders, leading legal leaders, uh, the work that you're doing on your podcast, the guests that you all have, the diverse conversations, the real, raw, honest conversations that you are having there, making a massive, massive difference. I've been in the legal space for 26 years, and I'm really passionate on the employee side of creating entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs world. And thank you for all the work you're doing with the attorneys. Thanks, Molly. We've reached the end of another impactful conversation on the Hire and Empower podcast. Whether this was your first episode or you're a longtime listener, I know you can tell I have passion for people. Whether you're a business owner, employee, executive, or hiring manager, I understand the situation you're in. Hiring, onboarding, and leadership is expensive, exhausting, overwhelming, and if that's not enough, it's also time-consuming. My friends, it doesn't have to be this way. There is a team at H&E that has your back. For over 25 years, they've transformed over 4,000 law firms into efficient, effective, profitable assets for their business and made it fun to come to work again. Check out our Smart Hire Solution, our Employee Leadership Program, and the 66-Day Law Firm Turnaround at HiringAndEmpowering.com. This episode is being sponsored by Legal Ease Marketing. Listen, law firms have many ebbs and flows, and we tend to see this typical pattern. When things around the office are slow, lawyers get better at following up. But when the bustle is back, they tend to drop the ball. What if you had a system in place that not only automated follow-ups, but could guide potential clients seamlessly through the intake process and beyond? 
The team at Legal Ease works with your firm to create a custom pipeline of emails, text messages, and follow up calls sent to your leads when you want them to be sent. Whether it's a consultation confirmation email sent a minute after the request goes through, long term nurture email sent six months later, a request for Google reviews sent to the most opportune times. They put a system in place that improves your client experience while taking tasks off of your plate. Or maybe you're already rolling in a software or CRM, but it's not set up as you want. Or perhaps you know you could be maximizing your automations more. Sometimes it's hard to tell what you need without a deep dive into your account. That's where Legal Ease audits and analysis come in. First, their team will learn everything about your processes and how you intend them. Then they'll go through your automations and map out the needed changes. Lastly, you'll discuss a plan forward and how to make your optimized office a reality. Legally's team pushes the boundaries of what automation can do to help your firm operate in ways you think were possible. Don't let potential clients slip through the cracks by not following up with them. Schedule a consultation today with Legally's Marketing. They look forward to helping you create more time, consistency, and your KPIs. To learn more, go to legalesemarketing.com and book your free consultation call today.